सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली देर इज वेरी सिग्निफिकेंट एक्शन फ्रॉम मोदी गवर्नमेंट एंड इनफैक्ट इट्स रिफॉर्मिस्ट एक्शन on what is described as military cantonments and chances are that this will generally pass under the radar you might see stories i i noticed that a couple of the newspapers had it on page 1 small story some insight but it is a very important reform and to understand why it's an important first of all why it's a reform and second why it's important we have to understand what cantonments are what is the definition of a cantonment how many cantonments are there how did they come into being and what will happen now when one by one they'll cease to be cantonments and what will it mean what will it mean for civilian population living living there but most importantly what will me what will it mean to indian armed forces in terms of their preparedness their focus their need for land because armed forces need land we'll talk about that but before i get there let me also apologize to you for missing cut the clutter for almost an entire week we just had our our renewed tryst with covid and i have to tell you that uh, that while it was quite gentle on us we are twice vaccinated and boosted so if you are not boosted get yourself boosted because what happens is that even if you are boosted you can get infected which happened with us you can still get infected but it is very gentle covid respects you it can still infect you but it respects you if you've been vaccinated twice and boosted so get yourself boosted because you know it's not nice to get covid because whatever else might happen it robs a whole working week from you which is what it did with us so that out of the way back to the back to the story of the day so cantonments the cantonments came into being like many other things to do with the modern indian military in british times east east india company after they established their control over large parts of india particularly the east of india or the bengal the bengal region the extended bengal region after the battle of plassey in 1757 lord clive established the first cantonment that was barakpur in west bengal although there is some dispute over whether barakpur came first or danapur came first barakpur danapur there abouts and then some more came in what was the logic logic was that these were troops or large bodies of troops who needed to be located some place india did not have cities then to immediately house so many of these soldiers particularly so many europeans also a lot of these soldiers were suffering from malaria smallpox uh, if i read if i read the website of the direct directorate general of defense states our government's directorate general of defense states that tells me that east india company's commanders they were concerned that their soldiers were picking up these diseases which are tropical diseases malaria smallpox gastroenteritis etc also venereal disease what that had to do with hot weather i don't know that is the old name for sexually transmitted disease but that also was a logic to confine their soldiers into or cocoon their soldiers into fenced off areas and these these areas were then chosen away from cities in very isolated areas where a lot of empty land was available so this land was taken these little military townships were developed surplus land was also taken then in the course of time then in the course of time because armed forces also also need logistics so logistics merchants grocery shops schools post offices all of that started coming in as all of that started coming in the civilians started coming in as civilians started coming in the grants of land and and working rights and living rights to so civilians started coming in and that's how this cantonments began to grow into cities then as india grew india's population grew the british left cities grew into this cantonments now if you go to any cantonment uh, cantonments you might be familiar with go to any cantonment that you are familiar with you can't tell the difference between the city and the cantonment except if you go into the military area military areas where military installations are 
military offices are military housing is that is what that is what is called areas under a1 land so a1 land in a cantonment belongs purely to the military then there are other categories of land there are seven categories of land land for post office land for schools etc etc because as i told you cantonments are now not just mini cities they are now full fledged cities now that has led to many challenges and i will list those for you but i will tell you exactly what's happened now what's happened now is that by notification modi government first of all modi government has taken a principled decision to abolish all cantonment boards these cantonments were not being managed either by the armed forces or by a municipal corporation they were being managed managed by a body by a unique body called cantonment boards and these cantonment boards were being run under a different law the cantonment act the first it came up in 1889 cantonment codes were issued in 1899 then in 2006 under upa government the cantonment act was again amended and modernized so these cantonment boards have a constitutional status each cantonment board is a municipality under clause e of article 243p of the constitution right but they are not part of the adjoining cities municipality so this is this is a sui generis thing now what's happened in the cantonment is that the military lives there the soldiers live there the commander lives there and there is also the civilian authority that controls defense estates that is represented by the cantonment board cantonment boards are elected so if they have 16 members eight are elected so there is election politicians come in soldiers the commanders have to deal with politicians all the time and politicians the call is a boss uska clearance kar do uska kaam kar do help so and so help so and so and the second thing is and the second thing is that the armed forces then have to get involved in the management of civilian properties because these cantonment boards have eight elected members so there is an election can you imagine where the armed forces are located there is also an election in fact 2006 law the 2006 law democratized or quote and quote democratized or politicized cantonment boards even further making these elections to be much more like regular municipal corporation elections and yet authority was divided so that was leading to a lot of trouble what modi government has now done is modi government has said that these cantonment boards will be abolished so in every cantonment where the military is located wherever the military installations are military housing is military schools are military hospitals are training areas are that area will be demarcated as a military station military station not a cantonment there once again as was the idea say 260 years ago once again armed forces will be cocooned so in a military station you can fence off a military station you can control access in and out of a military station and armed forces can do their own stuff there without without having to share these spaces with civilians in what is in many ways like an operational come training come administrative military areas so once again you are separating the military and the civilians so the idea initially of cantonments was to create these spaces exclusively for the armed forces then the civilians and the cities grew not just around them but into them that is that is what is being rectified once again so the first step is notification that modi government has issued on yol cant now yol is up in the mountains in himachal pradesh look at the map yol is close to dharamshala yol very interestingly was set up as a prisoner of war camp for german prisoners of world war 1 not world war 2 world war 1 they were kept there and then after independence as tibetan refugees came and because this pow space was available basically government had space available this space this space was provided also to house tibetan refugees that's the reason we know that the lai lama and the whole tibetan community has come up generally in that area yol today is an important military station yol is the headquarters of the 9th core of indian army right 9th core is a very important core of indian army it was is a lot of area in the north 9th core headquarters will remain there but now once you separate the two it will be possible to fence off or quarantine military areas and take the civilian areas out of civilian functions out of it which means 
the local commanders will not have to bother about the civil military disputes, civil defense state disputes. This leads to a lot of corruption, but basically it leads to a waste of time. I was having a conversation with Lieutenant General H.S. Panag, who is also our columnist, and he pointed out to me that when he was army commander, he's commanded the Central Army and the Northern Army. He said as army commander, he had to hold court. So any army commander in India has to hold court like a judge to rule over disputes between civilians and defense states people, civilians in the cantonment board in cantonment lands. And he said, time is wasted. You hold court. It's not something that you're trained to do. You sit like a judge. You give an order. In any case, whoever doesn't like, whichever side does not like the order, then goes to high court, then Supreme Court, and so on and so forth. All of that right now is being addressed. So Yol is the first to lose its cantonment status. The next will be Nasirabad. Nasirabad is in Rajasthan not far from Ajmer. Ajmer also is a cantonment, by the way. It's the only cantonment created by India after independence. Now you must, might ask me, how can it be? Only one cantonment created after independence. That's because a cantonment is a constitutional and legal entity. After independence, what India has done everywhere, India has built a lot of, lot of military installations everywhere. But those have not been called cantonments. So there are no cantonments, no cantonment boards, no elections, no mixing of civilian and this and that. These are classical military stations which can be fenced off and where entry and exit can be controlled. So if you look at if you look at Jaipur, for example, Jaipur is the headquarters of an entire command, uh, Southwestern Command, Chandi Mandir on the outskirts of Chandigarh, headquarters of Western Command among the biggest commands, probably the biggest command in Indian Armed Forces. But those are not cantonments. Those are military stations. Batinda, again, a new station built. Batinda is a core headquarters, but it's a military, it's, it's not a cantonment. It does not have a cantonment board. It is a well-defined, clearly defined military station. And it's, it's the experience now of the Armed Forces and government. And once again, I've spoken with at least two former army chiefs, including General B.P. Malik, and the general sense is that a military station works more effectively and a manner that is more military, that's more military than, 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 than a cantonment. Now, these cantonments, some of these are very large. So, Yol, maybe Nasirabad, these are not the most, these are not the toughest to dis disengage civilians and military people from each other. But many others will bring in much stronger challenges where, where cities have grown in, where encroachments have grown in. So those will be bigger challenges. But the fact is that it's about time that this reform started. It's And it's a brave reform. So 2018, the armed forces spe specifically asked for this change. They wanted to get rid of the responsibility of having to manage cantonment lands. You might even remember that Nirmala Sitaraman, when she was defense minister, she allowed civilians movement through access through military areas, through cantonment areas, because cities have grown around cantonments and into cantonments. Now, to think that to go from one part of the city, say a city like Pune, Agra, right, any of the big city, any of the big cantonments, to go from one place to the other, if the cantonment area is sealed off to you, then what do you do? So she had opened up many of these areas. For example, in Delhi, earlier, if you caught a lot of traffic on the regular route to, to the airport from central Delhi, you had no choice. You could not have gone through cantonment areas, right? Cantonment areas to your west, west of the road leading to the airport. But she opened some of these up. So you can now also take another detour through the cantonment area. So this conflict, military-civilian conflict, is also being addressed now. Now, a little bit more about cantonments. How did the cantonments come in? I told you that the British built these. Robert Clive built the first two, Barakpur and Danapur. And then more came in. And you see where these, and you see where these camps have come in. First of all, if you see India in different military zones, not now with South Western Command and all that, those are now sort of zones created out of zones, but say north, south, east, west, and central, right? If you, if you see these sectors, then which is the sector that you would imagine that might have the largest number of cantonments? You might think it's north because Kashmir, China border, etc. are there. You might think the western sector 
because all of the Pakistan border is there, maybe part of China also at least, they abut each other and there is a lot of interac interaction. You will be surprised to know, or maybe you will not be surprised to know because you are all wiser than me, that Northern Command, that all of Northern Command, which watches all of Kashmir, Ladakh, etc., all of Northern Command has only one containment. And that is Badami Bagh in Srinagar. Only one containment. All of the Western Command, again a vital command, all of the Western Command, right, has 13 containments. All of India has 62 containments, of which Northern Command has only one. And Western Command, and these two we see as our most operational commands, right? Western Command has 13, of which seven are pure hill stations. Because the British, their soldiers, their families, the war wounded, they all needed mountains, cool climate for, for rest, recuperation, training, whatever, free time. That's how they built up these cantonments in the mountains. So the seven out of 13 in the Western Command are pure hill stations. Today they're being used for this and that. I think a couple of them are Gurkha, Gurkha Regiment training centers. But see, Baklo, Dakshai, Dalhousie, Jutog, Kasoli, Yol, Sabatu, all of these are hill stations, right? So seven are pure hill stations to take them out. That leaves only six cantonments in the in the western zone, the western sector. These include Ambala, Amritsar, Delhi, Firozpur, Jalandhar, Jammu. Now look at Eastern Command. Once again, all of China, Sikkim, Bhutan, Arunachal, all of that comes under Eastern Command. All of Eastern Command has four. That is only four, only four Containments, right? And that's where the first ones came up, set, set up by Robert Clive. Just four there. And these four also include one in the mountains, that is Shillong, which also was initially set up as a, pla as a place where British, Br British soldiers or European soldiers could rest, recuperate, run their non-operational offices, etc., etc. Southern Command has 19. Now you might say, what the hell is happening in Southern Command? You, might, you would imagine that if Indian Armed Forces are facing threats on the north, on the east, and maybe in the central sector, uh, that is UP Uttarakhand border uh, with, uh, with China or Himachal Uttarakhand border with China, India's Armed Forces should be closer to those operational areas. On the other hand, it is the south which has 19 cantonments, 19 cantonments of which only one is a kind of a hill station, that is Wellington, which is the, where the defense services staff college is located. Other 19 are big stations, for example, Pune, Ahmednagar, Belgaum, big Big training centers located there. Devlali, Devlali is artillery. Belgaum is the commando training center. Ahmednagar is the Armored Corps uh, Tanks Training Center. Pune is a command headquarters. So these big ones, how come, why did they come up in South? So how come when the Northern Command has only one containment, Western Command has only 13 of which seven are hill stations, so effectively six operationally important containments, or maybe you can add Yol because there's a core headquarters there. Seven, Southern Command has 19. And finally, we told you to begin with that we have 62 containments, of which only one is in the Northern Command, 13 are in Western Command, 19 are in Southern Command, and 4 are in Eastern Command, right? So where are the rest? All the rest, that is 25 of them, 25 of them are in Central Command. Now what are they doing in Central Command? Let me read out the names of some of these containments under Central Command. One odd is in the mountains, so you can understand. But look, look at some of the names. Meerut, Mathura, Lucknow, Bareilly, Chakrata in the mountains. Landor, we can understand. Landor, Chakrata, uh, Almora again in the mountains. Lansdowne, again in the mountains. Dehradun in the foothills. Uh, Fazabad, Fatehgarh, Jabalpur, Lucknow, Mao. These are all in the plains far away from any borders, far away from any operational areas. Once again, why were the British setting up these cantonments in these areas? Remember, go back to 1857. Starting with 1757, the Battle of Plassey, till 1857, till the British fully established their power over India. Until then, 
the maximum trouble the British had had was in the east of India, like the east of Delhi. And that's why, because even 1857, the revolt was carried out by people of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Bengal, etc. That is where the British built so many cantonments. Again, why so many cantonments under the southern command? Because that's where the British were having problems with Tipu Sultan, with the Marathas, right? So they had to, they had to establish these big garrison towns there so that the flag would be there and the armed forces will not just be available close by in case they were challenged, but also this was a kind of static flag march because Miri Fauji that bet here. Look at my armed forces. This is my authority. So wherever the British had trouble, they established these garrison towns. Now, you might say that didn't they have trouble in the western sector? They did, did, did have trouble in the western sector along what is the northwest frontier province in Pakistan because they also had fears of the Russian Empire pushing its way or the Soviet Empire later on pushing its way into the subcontinent. So they also built a lot of cantonments in what is Pakistan in those areas. So these cantonments are a legacy of that past. These have very little, little to do with today's operational requirements or today's operational imperatives. And today, because so much of this civilian military intermeshing has taken place, it's also caused many problems and a lot of litigation and it's forcing military officers to waste a lot of their time. For example, on a cantonment boat, at least notionally, the army, the commander of the army station is the president of the cantonment board. You might say it's notional, but it's a job to do. It's a bunch of meetings to attend. This is not something that soldiers were trained for. That is now being reformed, which is a good thing. As for the cantonments being everywhere, I will give you an example. Whenever I travel to Pakistan, anybody travels to Pakistan and, and I presume, in fact, I know the same thing happens when Pakistanis travel to India. When you get a visa on your passport, there is a stamp on the side, rubber stamp on the side saying not valid for containment areas. Now, I would ask my friends in Pakistan that, look, you give me these visas saying not valid for containment areas. Tell me a way of reaching from Lahore airport to the city or, or from Karachi airport to the city, Peshawar airport to the city, or even Islamabad airport to Rawalpindi without crossing a containment area because these containments have become so big. These British era containments are so big, they've grown around the cities and cities have grown around them that this separation of civilian and containment zones is an impossibility. And that's why I, I would say that anytime I come, uh, come into Pakistan, I'm in violation of my visa terms because I'm driving, at least driving through uh, a containment area. And, and so would be the predicament of many people coming from other countries into India because a lot of our cities, if you bar them from containment areas, you end up barring them from half the city or not more. That's why this change is good. What is military should remain military. What is civilian should become fully civilian and that would make it smoother for everybody for both sides.